Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Yang Lee, and I'll be serving as your online chaplain today. I'll be with you in the chat, both on Zoom and on Facebook. A warm welcome to all of you, especially if you're visiting with us today. We were eager to greet you and learn how God is at work in your life. So stay tuned. We'll say more about that later in the service. If you are joining from home, you'd like to symbolically participate in the sacred meal of the Eucharist, Find something simple to eat and drink, and keep an eye on the chat for more instructions. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, take a breath 
and let yourself rest here in God's presence. Come, let us worship God together. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God, Son, now and forever. Amen. Together we pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. With you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, from whom all good proceeds, grant that by your inspiration we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding may do them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Sarah Gardner. 
Our first reading is from the book of Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built to the altar, he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Michael's. My name is Jeff. The second reading is the letter of Paul to the Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants. Not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. 
for he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, Suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. 
Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. The Gospel of the Lord. We now invite our bless children to come forward for a blessing. They will then go off for class and return at time of communion. Kids, may you be blessed by wonder and awe and joy as you go to godly play today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the rest of us can be seated. <clears throat> so as some of you know, I've been rehabbing my knee since surgery and the only exercise I can, or the, the exercise I can most safely do is to ride my stationary bike, which is incredibly boring. So I've been listening to podcasts to try to take my mind off of it. And I've heard some recently from Ezra Klein from the New York Times. Maybe because he's a parent of young children, he's been asking questions that I am wondering about myself these days about the burden of caring for children and for the elderly, and who is doing that in our country, about the plague of loneliness in our culture, about our isolation from one another in this country. And although he's a journalist, raised as a secular Jew, he is curious enough about organized religion to note when it offers something that we humans need. The practice of Sabbath and rest, for example, the connections with other people, the structure of meaning beyond our own daily lives. And in the recent one, he interviews the author of a book about intentional communities. So everything from monasteries to utopian sort of social experiment groups. All through human history, these different experiments that humans have made with living in extended communities of support beyond the nuclear family. I won't go into the whole conversation. It's interesting. I commend it to you. But I found it especially interesting that they pointed out that although these experiments are often seen as radical, in fact, even right now in our culture, there are two distinct times in our lives when we do tend to live in these kind of extended communities. In young adulthood, when we go to college and live in dorms or share apartments and on into the first few several years of life after college. And old age, when we go into maybe retirement facilities or assisted living communities. But in the long stretch between those two phases of life, when many are working in their careers, maybe raising kids, taking, pair of, taking care of aging parents, maybe volunteering in their community in some way, juggling all the combined social and financial stresses of life, we tend to live in the most isolated way possible in the single family home, and especially in America in that suburban single family home with the fence around it and the garage door pulled down. 
And not everybody in this country can or does live in this way, but it's the prevailing image in our media of normal American life. And with that image, the message we hear is that when you're a real adult and you've really made it, you go it alone. You close yourself off from other people and you do your life, complicated though it may be. And we're all supposed to be able to do that as grown-ups. But all the evidence of social sciences lately has been showing us that a lot, perhaps the majority of people in this country are exhausted, depressed, physically unhealthy, in broken relationships, in debt, overusing alcohol and other substances as they try to live out this American dream. These intense pressures of life combined with the isolation that we live in are damaging so many of us. And yet still we persist in dreaming that dream and thinking that it is somehow the right way to be. Do it all, keep going, don't drop out, and don't ask for help. Because how embarrassing if you can't manage it. We think that we live in a culture without shame. Well, this is where the shame is attached. If you can't do your life the way you're supposed to do it, if you fail to launch at the beginning, those horrible words we give to young adults, or if later you lose your job or your marriage ends or somehow you just can't handle it, what shame. You're supposed to manage, especially if you're in that long stretch of life called being a grown-up. Now these specific pressures are very distinctly American, but that idea that there is a model of success that we're all supposed to attain that actually is not really attainable, there's been iterations of that throughout human history. Different ideas of what that looks like, but often unattainable to most people. And it shows up right there in our gospel reading today as voiced by the Pharisees, Jesus's favorite critics. In the story, the first thing that happens is Jesus calls one more disciple to come be part of his 12. Not a fisherman this time, it's Matthew, the tax collector, the collaborator with the occupying regime. And then he joins Matthew and all of his tax collector, collaborator, and deadbeat sinner friends for dinner. And right away, here come the Pharisees. Huh. Look at these people that he is keeping company with now. All the people whom we try to avoid. All the people who have totally messed up in life. And he is hanging out with them as if they're worth it. And in response, Jesus says to them, people who are well don't need a physician. People who are doing just fine don't need the healing that I'm here to bring. Only those who are sick and in need need God's healing. The messed up ones need me. And right on cue, someone comes up and asks for his healing. And it isn't somebody the Pharisees might have expected to hear it from at all. It's a highly placed official from the synagogue, this fellow Jairus. And he comes right in to the place where Jesus is hanging out with all of these messed up people. And he begs Jesus to come and heal his child, his 12-year-old daughter who is at the point of death. And this is all in Capernaum, which is Jesus's hometown. So plausibly, Jesus and Jairus know each other well. Perhaps Jesus even knows this girl, and he gets up immediately and goes to head towards Jairus's house. 
And whatever assumptions we have about what a household in a patriarchal culture would look like, what a father-daughter relationship would look like, clearly this father, Jairus, is desperately uh, beloved. What's the word I'm trying to get? He, his child is beloved. He loves her deeply. And he has done everything he can. No expense has been spared to try to heal her from whatever this illness is. But there she is on her deathbed. And before Jesus can even get to the house, he's interrupted by somebody else, somebody else who also needs healing, an older woman who is reaching out to take hold of his garments as he passes by. She has needed this healing for 12 years, exactly as long as the girl has been alive. And all that time, she has been an outcast, an unclean pariah on the edge of the community, making it on her own, living desperately on the margins. And who knows what those Pharisees have been saying about her during all these years. And by the way, there's this amazing painting of this encounter in a church in Magdala by the Sea of Galilee. It's a painting just of men's feet and the bottoms of their robes, and then this one lone hand coming in to touch the figure at the center. The woman gets her healing, but not without stopping Jesus in his tracks. His urgent mission to this young girl totally derailed. But Jesus turns and says to the woman, daughter, take heart. Your faith has saved you, and she is healed fully. And then he keeps going to the house. He restores the other daughter in the story to life, and he restores the father from his terror over his child. All three of these people receive Jesus's healing. There's enough to go around. I should say also, my mom used to tell me that she used to hate this story. It pops up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because my sister was 12 when she was diagnosed with leukemia. And my mom would pray, and the last thing she wanted was for some old lady with her problems to get in the way of Jesus coming to heal my sister. Now, my sister was healed by a transplant. It gave her 39 more years. And later in life, mom, as an older woman herself, came to have compassion for that woman in her need. We do, over the course of our lives, realize God's grace and healing are not limited in scope. Jesus does have time for everybody that needs him. But the thing is, everyone needs him. The well-protected young girl of privilege, the lonely old woman who is shunned by society, the prominent leader of the synagogue, they all need him. Three different generations of people, three people with widely varying degrees of power in their culture, not one of them able to go it alone and do it all themselves. They need help, and Jesus has it for them. We need what God has to offer. Wealth and prestige, go-it-alone resourcefulness, someone to take care of us, none of us keeps us from needing what God has. No matter what we or our inner Pharisees might think. We try and try to pretend otherwise. But no matter how outwardly successful we are, we all come up to the edges of what we can manage. We get a chilling diagnosis, or someone we love has an accident. Our spouse gets called into the office on Monday morning and finds their job has been eliminated. The landlord sells our building and evicts us. Smoke from wildfires hundreds of miles away gets into our lungs. These aren't hypothetical. These have happened in recent weeks to people I know. 
we realize that we are not actually in control of any of it, despite what we imagined. We're the ones failing at life. We're messed up, no matter how hard we try. My priest colleague, Rick Fabian, is one of the co-founders of the Church St. Gregory of Nyssa out in San Francisco, kind of a wonderful cosmic Episcopal church. And he insisted on carving those words of the Pharisees into the wood of the altar that they built for their church. This fellow eats with tax collectors and sinners. It was the worst thing they could say about Jesus. And as Rick likes to point out, sinners is a nice translation for what the word really says in Greek. But the Pharisees were right because that table, this altar, is a welcoming table that Jesus spreads for a meal with all of us. The ones who can't manage it all. The ones who are falling apart. The screw-ups. The ones who need him. In other words, everyone. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners, Jesus says. I've come to call everybody. Everybody who recognizes that they can't do it all and go it alone. Everyone who hasn't yet figured that out, but probably will sometime soon. All of us are called. And all of us are healed, even in ways we may not recognize right away. There is enough of Jesus' healing for all of us. There is enough to share at the table. And there is so much more where that came from. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable and let us together profess the church's faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Stephanie. Please join me in the prayers of the people. When I say, God of grace, please respond, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, enliven the church for its mission, that we may, that we may be salt of the earth and light to the world. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. Let us pray for the church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Andrew, Alan, Mary, and Matthew, our bishops, for the parishioners, lay leaders, clergy, and staff of St. Michael's, for all those at work on our parish, re, uh, re, sorry, on our parish renovations, for our partner parish St. Peter's in Eaton Square, London, and for our friends at St. Luke's Church and School in Martell, Haiti. God of grace, hear our prayer. Creator of all, lead us into ways of justice and peace that we may respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. Let us pray for the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Spirit of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others. That all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ in one another and love as Christ loves us. Let us pray for our community. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of hope, Comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Give comfort to those who mourn and bring them peace in their time of loss. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. We pray for Ridge, Charlie, Alexis, James, Liza, Milton, Neil, Catherine, Elijah, Virginia, and Gita Ben. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, into your hands we commend those who have died, including Stephen Rumpf and Helen Hickey. May their example inspire and encourage us. God of grace, hear our prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept our prayers and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And friends, may the peace of Christ be always with you. Amen. Share with one another a sign of Christ's peace. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice for all.
God be with you. And And also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time, You sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By Christ's blood, we are reconciled. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Almighty God, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our forebears, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, Risen Lord be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Holy One, accept these prayers and praises through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your Church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray.
We are gathered here at God's table in body and in spirit. All of us are welcome wherever we are on our spiritual journey to receive the gifts here because these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
stand as you are comfortable, and let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Christ our Savior. Amen. Be seated for a few announcements. Oh. Be seated. And would the Eucharistic visitors come forward? We'll kick off the announcements with sending off our Eucharistic visitors. It's even in the bulletin.
Well, in the name of St. Michael's Church, we send you out very holy gifts from our table that those to whom you go will share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We are many are one body. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, it is good to be here with you today. A special welcome if you're here visiting us for the first time or after a long time away. Ray Robinson, good to have you back. Um, and so wonderful to get to be with you on the beautiful sort of beginnings of what feels like summer. Um, it is, first and foremost, I think important to say a huge thank you for all the people that made all the festivities of last Sunday happen, in particular, the barbecue and the potluck that happened um, at the end of the service and they kind of kicked off our summer. Kyle Okamoto in particular and his whole family and all those who volunteered. Would you please stand so we can give you a round of applause for last week. Thank you for that work, and it is so important to keep expanding our table and making sure that there is plenty of room for all of us mess-ups uh, to come around the table together. So look for more opportunities. Um, we'll be doing a, you know, a similar sort of barbecue and potluck and everything to kind of start the year, the beginning of September. Might even make it into something like a block party if we can pull that off. So there will be lots of possibilities for us all to chip in and be part of that. Um, Couple things coming up that are in the email that you receive. If you don't currently receive it and you'd like to, go to the QR code on the back of your bulletin and you can sign up for that. We are, our small groups are finishing up their time reading a book by Walter Brueggemann and he will be with us by Zoom to talk about that or anything else that we want him to talk about. He is a well-known sort of Christian uh, author, theologian, biblical scholar in the church. And on Wednesday, June 21st at 7 o'clock, we get to have them all to ourselves. So anybody that wants to be part of that, the link for that will be in our email that's coming out um, regularly in your email inbox. The next couple of Sundays, we've got some special um, celebrations to commemorate in our worship together. Next Sunday, it will be Juneteenth. And the Sunday after that, the 25th, will be Pride Sunday. And on both of those days, there's going to be sort of special chance to be together and celebrate those important milestones in our common life. Um, on the 25th also, there is a delegation potentially going to be part of the Pride March that day. If you're interested in being part of the St. Michael's group for that, get in touch with Julie. Her email is in the, in, is in the, is in the email. Anything else? Yes. Okay. And there's actually been a fair number of birthdays recently that all of which are important and, and, and things that we need to celebrate. But one happens to be today, and it's Damon Hancock who sits up in the back and we never even get to enjoy the, the, his being in front of us anymore because he's up there doing our live stream and our video and all of that. And so I think we need to make Damon come out from behind his computer screen so that we can. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Damon, happy birthday to you. Please stand for our final blessing. Friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel life's road with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. Be generous in all your loving and all your giving. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.